It's a real honor to be asked to introduce Candace Vogler. In my uh, moral philosophy class, I give the students at various points in the semester certain questions that I want them to think about to connect the text we're reading with their lives. And one of the questions I ask them is, uh, whom do you admire and why? What sort of character traits do the people you admire have? And then I ask them to think about critically about whether they ought to admire those traits or not, or, or, and if they have genuine admiration. So frequently they'll turn to me and say, what about you? And Candace doesn't know this, but she's one of the people that I mention, uh, and the, the only philosopher that I mention. Candace Vogler is the David B. and Clara E. Stern Professor of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. She also currently serves as the Chair of Virtue Theory for the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham in the UK. She was also named a Fellow of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. She served at Chicago as co-director of the Master of Arts programs in the humanities. She writes widely in moral philosophy and throughout other disciplines in philosophy. Her research is quoted by everyone who's doing serious work in contemporary ethics. In 2015, she received a major Templeton Foundation grant for her project, Virtue, Happiness, and the Meaning of Life, a project that brought together philosophers, social scientists, and religious thinkers to examine the role of self-transcendence in a meaningful life. She's written books on Mill, on embodiment, on self-transcendence, Duke University, Harvard, University Press, and she's currently writing a book on the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. We have a category at Baylor called Alumni by Choice. I happen to be blessed to be an alumnus by choice at Baylor. Candace makes me think we need a new category of faculty by choice of Baylor University. You saw she shows up more than Darren in the video. She's been involved with Crane Scholars, with Communio. She's been involved with the Lilly Fellows Program. She's lectured here. She's here uh, not as much as we'd like, but she's here a lot. One of my favorite philosophers, Blaise Pascal, has who writes in aphorisms, has a really brief one. It's Pious scholars rare. Anything good plus scholar is rare. Piety, virtue, we tend to be maniacally focused on our work, and that's Pascal's point. Candace, one of the reasons Candace is a hero of mine is that she combines virtues you usually do not find together in any human being, and sadly, especially in the academy. She combines brilliance and humility, rigorous philosophical argument, and deep faith, and she is someone whose philosophical thinking and teaching is thoroughly integrated into her entire life. Darren's wise. He got the right person to give the talk to talk about the relationship of faith and learning. It's my great privilege to introduce Candace Vogler to speak to you tonight. I can't possibly live up to that, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That was amazing. Um, I'd love to know her. <laughs> she sounds great. Um, for, a, for a lot of years now, I have uh, half-jokingly told people that I'm practically like an adopted faculty member at Baylor. I mean, because I'm here a lot. Um, but if I were to be more accurate, I would say that I'm an adopted member of the Institute for Faith and Learning. <laughs> because that's really the place where I've engaged the most, done the most kinds of activities, and so on. I started out being a speaker at the Educating for Wisdom conference in 2011, 
Darren had gotten my name from someone, and he just, he'd never heard of me. He didn't know. He thought maybe I was, I was not, not a good choice. But we had this phone conversation, and it, we just kept talking and talking and talking. And it was like I had discovered a kindred spirit with the most beautiful musical voice I'd ever heard in my life, who was happy to just talk about basically faith and learning, being a Christian educator, all these kinds of things. Now, I'm in the position of being a Christian educator at a secular university. So it's a slightly different challenge for me. But um, coming back to Baylor always feels like coming home again for me. I love you guys. I love it here. Um, when my mother, who's unfortunately now in hospice, um, although she's peaceful, which is really nice, um, when she still was ambulatory and had her wits about her, and I was starting my relationship with Baylor, she started watching Fixer Upper. <laughs> because she would say, it's in Waco, that's where your friends are. <laughs> Like, yes, mom, it's in Waco, and that's where my friends are. She's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, mom. Um, yeah. Now I should start giving you a real talk at this point that'll kind of connect with a lot of the things that you heard on the panel. I want to talk about students. Um, I want to talk about students at all levels, undergraduate students, graduate students, sort of thinking about going to college students. I want to talk about students at all levels. There's a really interesting thing about students, uh, which is that they're undergoing, a re when they're at a university, especially a place like Baylor, the University of Chicago, they're undergoing very serious kinds of intellectual formation. They're getting trained. They're making series of decisions about their futures that are going to open or close doors for them for the rest of their lives. And the whole time that that's happening, they're also undergoing a very profound period of personal and emotional development. Maybe they're falling in love for the first time. They're making new friends. They're finding new activities. They're trying to figure out where they belong. All these things are going on at exactly the same time. And if we're fortunate, they're also going very, undergoing very serious spiritual formation, even at a place like mine, <laughs> although nobody would ever say so out loud in Chicago. All of that is happening at once, and it's happening whether we think about it or not. One of the things I admire most about the Institute for Faith and Learning is that it's all they think about. All they're about is providing the opportunities for students and others to actually begin to integrate these incredibly powerful and important sort of trajectories of growth and development all at the same time. Now, in my institution, and I think generally at secular institutions, students are actually starved for opportunities to integrate their development in all these different areas. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my sort of efforts to try to imitate the kind of thing that you all enjoy here, thanks to having an Institute for Faith and Learning that attempts to make that gorgeous mission statement of yours concrete and real, person by person, all over Baylor. So, here's the kind of thing I say to my students. And my students are in lots of different programs of study. They're not all philosophers, happily. Um, 
The first thing I say to them is that an ethical self-image is incredibly important to human beings. It matters to us whether or not we think that we're good people. It matters so much that if you catch yourself doing something a little shabby, that voice starts going in your head about how, well, it's not really that you're doing this thing that's a little bit shabby. The circumstances are incredibly unusual. It's the only thing that you could do right now. Or other people do things that are much worse under similar circumstances. And on and on and on. That little voice can be read as an index of how important it is to you to feel like you're a good person. It's really important to all my students. It's really important to all your students. And if it isn't really important to you, I'd be very surprised. <laughs> now, that little voice is connected to some sense, however inarticulate and inchoate, of the sort of person you wish you were or you want to be. And that sense carries with it the beginnings of some standards that you place on your own conduct and your own responses to the world around you. Unsurprisingly, there's an enormous amount of empirical evidence that none of us lives up to those standards. <laughs> All of us fall short of our own sense of what it would mean for us to be the best kind of people we could be. So the challenge for me, um, and I think generally for Christian educators, is to figure out how to use the stuff that we're teaching our students to help them bridge the gap between the sorts of people they would like to be and the sorts of people they are. That's kind of what you want to be able to do. And that takes different forms or shapes in different disciplines. But no matter what you're teaching them, part of what you're trying to do in the way that you teach them is help them bridge that gap and let them help you bridge yours too. Because um, we're not immune from this, you know? It's like, I'm Catholic. We always have to go to confession. There's things, there's things to regret in my behavior. Okay. Now, what do they need besides a well-intentioned teacher at a moment like this? Well, the first thing they need is a community. They need to have the kind of support around them, an educational community, that can actually hold them when they're trying to do very important work, both in their direction of study, in their special fields, and also in their lives. They need a community. IFL helps them have these kinds of communities. I work really hard to try to help my students have those kinds of communities. Um, one of the activities I've been able, I've been delighted to help with a lot is the Communio retreat in the spring. I've, I've gone to Communio a lot. I love it. My husband loves it. He says it's the only big trip I ever take where I come back in better shape than I was in when I left. <laughs> because it's a spiritual retreat where we're worshiping together, we're sharing food together, and we're all having an opportunity to talk and reflect a lot on what it means to be a Christian educator, what that vocation is for us and how we try to realize it in classrooms with our students and outside of class with our students and so on. Okay, it's a fantastic thing. So, and everybody who is interested in becoming more the person they wish they could be needs a community around them to help support them in it because it's alarming to have to work on yourself. 
Um, and I mean, it may be that you guys are all fully actualized and realized and perfectly virtuous beings, and I'm just kind of the unfortunate thing in front of you, but it's not true for me <laughs> that I'm a perfectly actualized, fully virtuous human being up here. I wish I was, but I'm not. So, and I need support for that. Certainly my undergraduates need that kind of support. My graduate students need that kind of support. I wish that all the members of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago felt that they needed that kind of support. Um, but it's, it's not as common among the faculty um, there. But staff certainly need it. And they're aware of that at Chicago as they are in lots of places because they're the ones who make everything work and who get the least thanks and, notif and notice for all that they do. That's true at Chicago. It may not be true at Baylor, but it's true there. What, the other thing you need that you should be able to count on at Baylor, but you can't always at my university, is a sort of fundal, fundamental understanding of what realizing a Christian mission might amount to in an everyday way from one class to the next. Um, and the, part of the importance of the Institute for Faith and Learning is that it helps us all understand better what it's going to mean in a concrete way to bring our faith into our teaching in an everyday, all the time kind of way. And to bring it into learning all the time. Because you don't just become a faculty member and then stop anywhere. Not here, not at my university. So what you need is a way to have your faith animate you in an everyday way. It has to be strong enough to hold you. It really does. Not just when you're in private Bible study or prayer, not just when you're in a devotional group with other people, certainly not just when you're in church. You need it to be able to walk around with you. My pastor, who is a very troubled person, um, just between you, me, and the doorpost, um, has a wonderful saying, which is that church is what happens when you leave the building. Like what's going on when we're all together in the building is worship, which is an effort to be intimate with God and with one another and to share in that. But that what Christianity requires actually takes place when we leave the building and we're out moving around in the world. The way we do that, how we are with people, that's where the church has a life, in his view. Um, and that seems to me not wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, so it has to be the case that your faith can hold you when you're not in the building that it can hold you when you've got a stack of things to grade that you're not looking forward to. That it can hold you when family situations are complicated and you're supposed to be preparing class. That can hold you when a student comes to your office hours to talk to you about something that is not directly related to anything that you're teaching. Something in their lives. And they're trusting you to be there for them. Okay. It's got to be working when you first meet a room full of people who, are, who God has put in front of you as your students for the next little term. Right. I firmly believe that God has sent every one of my students my way. I never know why. I believe that all of them are operating in an economy of grace, but I can't possibly know what form that's taking in any of their lives. My job, 
given that I don't know exactly what God is doing in any of their lives, I don't know exactly what it would mean to cooperate with grace in any of their lives, but I can kind of get a sense for what it would mean to impede it. <laughs> and I can work very hard not to impede the work of grace in any of my students' lives. When I see a room, I mean, okay, I do various things before. I tend to teach large classes. So I'm about to go into a room with, you know, 110 people or 120 people I've never met before. And to prepare for that, um, I have downloaded the photo rosters from my university registrar website. And the photo rosters have become my prayer list for the month before class starts. It's my way of learning their names. And it feels important to do that because I feel like if I'm doing my job, then they're going to get to experience what it's like to be a genuine human being among fellow human beings, sort of turning their joint attention to some particular topic for 10 weeks. And the thing I know before I've seen them even and scared them by knowing their names <laughs> um, is that Christ died for every single one of them personally. I know that before I even meet them. I know that when they arrive the first day. And that's supposed to set a kind of a standard for how I am going to be with them over the next 10 weeks. And how we're going to arrange our time together so that they get the support to use whatever it is I'm teaching them as a vehicle to make a positive change in their lives, whatever that might be. Okay. So they don't know I'm praying for them, right? I know I'm praying for them. I've memorized their silly little, like, you know, ID card mug shots before I ever meet them. I've been asking for light and strength for every one of them and hope and help by name, individually, at my little, like, prayer bench in my study in the morning. So I feel like I'm invested in them in that way before I ever see them. And that, for me at least, is part of the beginning of understanding us to be a community. Because one of the things about a community is that you learn each other's names. They'll all know my name. They signed up for my class. <laughs> right. After the first day, they'll know the names of any TAs who are assisting in this effort. They don't know each other particularly well. But every time we meet, the first thing that we do is greet each other. So each of those students turns to the person on the right and the person on the left in the big tiered lecture hall um, and says hello. And I give them several minutes to just actually greet each other. And I tell them this is because the fact that this group of people has decided to gather together to think about these things for 10 weeks together is at least as interesting as anything we're going to read and more interesting than most of the stuff we're going to read, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> okay. Um, so, that's all in place for me before it's in place for them. They get used to greeting each other and recognizing each other. There's various strategies I have the TAs deploy in discussion sections that are all designed to help them learn about each other, get to know each other, and have serious conversations with each other. I apologize to all of you who've been to Communio and know my tricks backwards and forwards already, um, but it, it seemed worth mentioning because for me, this is part of the thing. 
that the Institute for Faith and Learning has taught me to become clearer about in the time I've been associated with the IFL. I've become much clearer on my own sense of vocation through the work that I've been doing with IFL. And that is like gold for me because I'm not at an institution where I can expect my colleagues to want to do Bible study with me or where we can all engage in prayer together or anything like that. There's things that you have at an unabashedly Christian institution that we don't have at the University of Chicago and they're very valuable things. But the stuff I can manage at Chicago, you can do better at your place. Because all your students, at least, know about Baylor and about its mission. Um, I would hope it was vivid for all of them, but if it's not always vivid for all of them, you at least have something in place that you can make vivid for all of them in the ways that you are with them, in the ways that you care about them and guide them and are available to them. As a fellow human being who's very interested in the way that your faith informs your teaching and their learning. So, I suspect, however, I mean, I sometimes fantasize about what it would be like to be at a Christian university, like how great that would be and all this stuff, right? I mean, like, ah, oh, everybody gets on all the time. Everybody understands that we're trying to live from love. Everybody understands what that love is. Everybody understands the unbelievable magnitude of the incarnation, the unbelievable power of the fact that God became a human being and died for our sins, right? Everybody walks around with that all the time. In my fantasy, that's what it's like here. Um, but I suspect that even at a place like Baylor, um, none of you fully is in a position to know the work of grace that's happening in the lives of the people around you. How God is working in the lives of your students. How God is at work in the lives of your colleagues and the people on your staff. That you don't know. Because how could we know? Right? That's the great thing about other people. There's this incredible mystery at the heart of every single one of these eternal beings that we get to just wander around with and say hi to and hug and greet and stuff. There's a mystery there. And that mystery is a place where God is working in their lives that we can't just see. We just have to know it's there. Right? And respect it. And give it reverence because there are fellow creatures. More than that, are, there are fellow human beings. Okay. So, the other thing I've learned deeply from IFL is that it does not matter what your Baylor job description is. It does not matter what sort of relationship you have with this institution and its students and its faculty. Whatever it is that you're doing, you can do it in a way that's informed by your faith, where your faith can hold you and strengthen you and make you more imaginative and creative and alive as you do it. I've learned that through communio. I have met people who are teaching nursing. I've met staff people. I've met economists. 
I've met people in political science. I've met engineers, right? Chemists. I've met all kinds of people. And when we come together, we come together as fellow Christians who are really interested in trying to work out in some detail what that vocation means for us as educators and as learners in our field and as researchers in our field. And it like doesn't matter what you're doing, right? Um, the place where I've tried to put this into practice the most at my university has been with students who are economics majors. I don't know if you've heard of something called the Chicago School of Economics. It's a thing. Um, and it makes it be the case that the biggest undergraduate major at my university is econ. Okay, now happily, the only social science I have any training in at all is economics. My colleague at CUA, Michael Gorman, jokingly says, oh, Candace, she knows social science, it's math. <laughs> like your social science is mathematics. And it's like, yeah, it kind of is. But, um, but we've got all these undergraduate, a third of our undergraduates are majoring in economics, okay? Um, and there I am, a moral philosopher, sitting over in the philosophy department, and I have to figure out what it will mean to serve these people. And I realize that what it's going to mean to actually serve these people is to know the kinds of things they're learning in all their other classes, and to try to design a course where we're reading exactly the kinds of things they're reading in all their, or studying in all their other classes, but we're doing it with an eye toward trying to bridge that gap between the sorts of people we wish we were and the sorts of people we unfortunately are. Right. So I invented a course. I went through the went to the trouble of getting it listed in the economics department. The only humanities course that's ever had an econ number is called Character and Commerce, Practical Wisdom in Economic Life, where Character and Commerce, my friend Neville Hode tells me, could be the title of any Jane Austen novel. <laughs> but what it is, is the, is the ethics course recognized by the economics department for um, all of the students who are on a business or finance track in their econ majors. So those are the babies I get. They're wonderful students. They were afraid of me initially because they thought, oh, she's from the humanities. She's gonna think that all of us are grubby people who only care about getting and spending. Me, I was scared of them because I was like, okay, I can solve a model to like an n dimension vector, but it, these people can do more than that. And I don't know enough to be teaching them. So we were all scared of each other, and it was a huge, roaring success. And it was a huge, roaring success because we started out with like ethical self image. And then the fact that those student, the students were inclined to think that there's these like tiny little well defined areas of your life which are the moral part, or the ethical part. And then there's everything else, which is not. So not only do they have this stuff on ethical self-image that they do think is really serious, um, but they also begin to understand that they're always in the ethical. They're never not in the ethical. That the classroom is an ethical situation. This dining room is an ethical situation. And they begin to realize that that means that all the stuff they do is ethical stuff, which is a huge surprise to them. But they really get excited about it, and they get thoughtful and reflective. One of the most important things about this class is that even though we're you know, reading all this I don't know, um, perspective taking, risk aversion, standard kinds of things during the week. At the end of every week, they, have, uh, they write me a page that's a reflective paper asking about how this material touches on actual human experience. 
and I'm, you know, it's the University of Chicago. I don't say anything about whose human experience or anything like that. But of course, they all think about their own lives. <laughs> so they all write about themselves. So on Thursday night, I get however many one-page reflective papers, which I read over the weekend and respond to over the weekend. And then on Monday, I tell us all what we were all thinking about to sort of catch us all up to date. Um, this little tiny bit of practice is enough to have made a number of these students go on to write one-page reflections every week from there on. Because they think it allows them to think about what they're doing in a way that connects up to things that really matter to them. Bigger things, more important things. They reflect on all kinds of things over the course. And the testimony, the student evaluations for this class, um, which I've done a couple times now and I'm gonna do again in winter quarter, read like testimonials. They're like long and thick and rich. And these are econ majors, so you get things like, in response to this class, I've altered my whole portfolio strategy. <laughs> it's just like, Things you never hear from a philosophy major. Um, or somebody in the humanities at all. Um, um, but they also use, it, use the stuff in the class to take in with job interviews. Because um, they get plucked up by big firms in their sophomore year. Um, and this class equips them to ask questions about what you do when your prospective employer has a little moral shabbiness somewhere around the edges. <laughs> um, I tell them, my paycheck comes from the University of Chicago. How long have you got? <laughs> There's a lot of moral shabbiness back behind there. Basically, any firm that has enough going to offer a brand new baby BA student that starting salary, chances are there's a little moral shabbiness back there somewhere. <laughs> you just poke, right? It's okay. You figure out what you actually have some control over, what kind of, what your team is gonna be like, what the good that your firm is bringing to the economy and the, the community is, how that relates to the larger good that an economy is. You ask these things. And in the area where you have some say, you act well. You be a good person. You do good in those areas. Don't, don't worry about trying to make the whole world morally right so that you fit into it without any friction. That's not what it means to be a good person. To be a good person is to take a very imperfect world and be a very imperfect person and find a way of moving and working in that world that allows you to be good. That's what we're about. That's what our class is about and so on. Now this um, I'm very excited because this experience with the econ students has been so successful, actually, um, that I managed to get a big plan through um, that should be all the way in place by January for the startup next year. And it's a multidisciplinary ethics minor at the University of Chicago. So what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a couple philosophy courses that our students take just to orient them to thinking about these things in ways that are unfamiliar to them, to thinking about actual life questions in themselves in these ways. And then they're gonna take three electives that are actually in their primary field of study, but electives that are designed to help them encounter and grapple with some of the kinds of challenges that they're likely to meet when they get out. Right. And any professional training program has these classes um, in abundance. 
Even econ has them <laughs> in abundance. They just don't name them as ethics classes. But if you go into them in the right spirit, they can become ethics classes. So it's going to be, uh, so that's, the, and the students will graduate with a special accreditation in ethics. Um, and my colleagues in econ would say, that might be a value-added moment, <laughs> right? Um, like, you're a pre-med student, you do really well, all this stuff. You take a minor in philosophy and people are gonna look at you like, say what? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> you thought reading Descartes was gonna help you with this? What's up? But if you graduate with a special accreditation in ethics, and that's been earned with a mixture of background courses in philosophy and then a, a set of electives that are specifically about biomedical concerns, that might look good <laughs> to a medical school as something that you're bringing that not every other student is bringing. And it might help you make a decision about whether or not those are the kinds of challenges you want to be facing in your professional life. So I'm really excited about this, but it's growing entirely out of this experience with the econ students, which I got the courage to try because of my association with the institution, Institute for Faith and Learning. So Chicago doesn't know it, <laughs> but they owe their new ethics minor to Darren Davis. <laughs> Thank you. lots of people still to thank and I can't thank them all but I do want to say Jim Benninghoff you've been a great blessing to the Institute for Faith and Learning for a long time and our association getting to work together on a variety of things and I just want you to know how much I appreciate you will you please stand so we can thank Jim Benninghoff I want to thank those who have spoken so beautifully today, Han Snyder, Tom Smith, Michael Evans, will you all please stand and uh, thank them for their panel. We're debu debuting new brochures, uh, celebrating IFL's 25th year. If you didn't get one, take one, take a couple, spread them around, spread the word. and. Uh, there are comment magazines at your table that we love for to share with you as, as a gift from IFL and, and from Anne.